but let's see in detail what is a transformation matrix. It's a matrix usually composed of the same number of rows and columns, the so-called squared matrix. In base of the dimension of the space in which we want to transform our points, we will have a different number of rows and columns. For example, for the 2D space, we will have a 3 per 3 matrix, and for 3D space, we will have 4 per 4 matrix. Also, a matrix can be row measure or column measure. That means that if we have a row measure matrix, we will consider rows those arrays displaced in vertical, and columns instead those arrays displaced in horizontal, and in the other way around, the column measure matrix. These are conventions, so one can decide to use one convention or the other. For these tutorials, we will use the row measure convention. We have three kinds of transformation matrices. But before to list them, it is important to talk about the identity matrix. Identity matrix can be defined as the default matrix. It has a series of ones along its diagonal, and among its useful properties, we have the possibility to multiply it with any other matrix, and we will always obtain, as a result, the other matrix, without any change. Let's list all the transformation matrices. We have the translation matrix that allows us to translate offset our vertices from a point to another one in the space. In a row measure matrix, the translation is placed here. Instead, in a column measure matrix, the translation part will be placed here. The rotation matrices that allow us to rotate our vertices around a specific axis. In fact, we have a rotation matrix for each axis, one for the X, one for Y, and the last one for the Z axis. Last but not least, we have the scale matrix. This allows us to stretch our vertices in many ways. There is the so-called uniform scaling, where the various vertices are stretched by a scale factor that is the same for all the axes. And then there is the non-uniform scale, same as the uniform with the difference that the scale factor can be different for each axis. The three scale factors, for example for 3D spaces, are placed in the diagonal of the matrix. Today we will see how to make and use translation and scale matrices. We will see more deeply the rotation matrix in the next tutorials. Well, we have already seen how to place the points or vertices of our polygon in order to show it on the screen, by placing it in the so-called screen space. The screen space is a coordinate system in which we have to place our points so that they can be visible on the screen. But this is the last coordinate system to reach. We have used it to easily place our points and make them visible immediately on the screen without using any transformation. But the reality is another. Screen space is the last of four coordinate systems in total. The first is model space, also called local or object space. The second is word space, the third is view space, and the fourth and the last space is the projection space, also called the screen space. Today we will focus mainly to the model and word spaces that are really important to start. In the next tutorials we will talk more deeply about view and projection spaces. Let's start with the model space coordinate system. The model space is a, the coordinate system in which all the original points of our 3D model are placed. With original we mean that the vertices of our model are the same that we have created in our favorite offering tool, like 3ds Max, 
Maya, Blender, etc. And so they are not trans in any way. For example, this is a model created in Blender. If we compare it with our quadrilateral, in this moment it is placed in this way. This is the starting coordinate system, so we don't have to do anything to reach it. Then we have the word space. What is the word space? It's the coordinate system in which we will place all of our 3D objects and in which they can be transformed in every way we want from their original position. It is called word because it acts exactly like it sounds, a word in which our objects can be placed and transformed. As an example, now we have the Blender models and now our quadrilaterals. How can we reach this space? By using the so-called word matrix. So we have to take each vertices of each of our models that in this moment are in the model space and multiply them by the word matrix transforming them in this way from model to word space coordinate system. But what is effectively a word matrix? It is a combination of zero or more transformation matrices. In fact, we can combine, or better to say, multiply our transformation matrices all together in order to achieve any transformation we want. How is it done the multiplication between matrices? It's a process that starts by taking the first row of the first matrix and the first column of the second matrix. Then we have to multiply the first element of the row with the first element of the column. Then sum it with the multiplication between the second element of the row with the second element of the column and so on in this way. The result would be placed in the cell indicated by the intersection between the row and the column. In this case, the cell at first row and first column. In the same way, we will do this between the first row and the second column. And we will place the result in the cell at first row and second column. And so on in this way. Let's return to the combination of multiple transformation matrices. We can, for example, combine translation and scale matrices to both translate and scale our points at the same time. But be careful, the order in which these matrices are multiplied is really important. In fact, if, for example, we take the translation matrix as the first matrix and scale as the second one, we will get a different result. Well, now let's talk about the view space. It requires a bit of in-depth explanation that we will discuss the next time, and for now it's enough to know that this is the coordinate system seen by the camera that we reach by multiplying the points transformed in world space with the view matrix. As the last thing, there is the screen space. Even this requires a bit of explanation. For now, let's say that is the coordinate system in which our points are projected from the three-dimensional space seen by the camera to the b-dimensional space of the screen. It is reached by multiplying the points in this space with the so-called projection matrix. To do all of this transformation, we will use our old friend's shaders. As a first thing, we will create and update at each render loop our word matrix. In particular, we will use the vertex shader to do all the matrices calculation. And to pass our matrices to our shaders, we will use another old friend that is the constant buffer. Then we will use our word matrix to make some animations, like this. To do this, we have to take care about a very important thing. Timing. The timing allows us to decide at which rate we can play our animations. In particular, we need the so-called delta time. What is delta time? 
It's the time, usually expressed in seconds, elapsed from the rendering of the previous frame and the rendering of the current frame. This value is updated at each render loop, allowing us to know in any moment how much time has elapsed to render the current frame. This is so useful because I have a particular property that allows us to reach a particular amount of units that we can decide freely each second. This will give us the ability to actually control the timing of our animation. Now we can start the class diagram. Today we will add a vector 3D class that represents a 3D point in the space and that will substitute the old back free structure. And then we will add the matrix 4 x 4 class that will represent our matrix class and where we will implement the set translate and set scale methods for the creation of the transform matrices. After the adding of these two classes, our class diagram will change from this to this. Very well, we can finally start the implementation. As a first thing, let's add a new filter and let's call it math. We can start to add a new header file that we call Vector3D. So let's create a class with the same name. This is nothing else than a class with three attributes that are the coordinates x, y and z. Let's create some constructors. The default one that initializes all of our coordinates to zero. Another one in which we add three parameters corresponding to the various coordinates. That we use to initialize our attributes. And the last one, where we pass a vector 3D object by reference. And that's all! Now we have a more useful Vector 3D class. Let's go to App Window class and let's substitute the previous Vector 3D structure with the new Vector 3D class. And obviously, let's change all of Vector 3D occurrences with our new class. Very well, we have updated all the necessary fields. 
Now we can start to implement the matrix 4x4 class. Let's copy past our vector 3D to speed up the implementation. And let's clean up a bit the code, changing the name of the class and removing all the unnecessary code. Well, here we have to add only an attribute, that is, a p-dimensional float array of 4 rows and 4 columns. Good, the next thing to do is to add the set identity method. First of all, let's reset our matrix, filling it with zeros by using the memset function. As we have seen in the introduction, Identity is a matrix with a series of ones along its diagonal, so we have to set one in correspondence of those cells where the indices of the row and column are equal. As next thing, let's create the set translation method. composed of one parameter, that is a vector 3D that represents the point to which we want to translate our vertices. And, as we have already seen, the translation in a row measure matrix is placed in the last row. Let's add our translation point there. Now the things start to be a bit more complicated. Here we construct a kind of projection matrix, called orthogonal projection matrix. We haven't talked about it in this tutorial because today we will focus mainly into the word matrix. But we need it in order to project our points to the screen space. Obviously we will talk about it the next time. Well, for now we can go to App Window and we can start to pass our matrices into the constant buffer. So let's add in the constant structure the word view. and projection matrix. Now we have to go to own update function and here where we pass the time variable in the constant object since now we have more things to load in the code to write will be much more so it's better to create a function where moving this code. Let's go to app window header file 
and let's call it update quote position. Let's implement it and let's start to move the code. Well, obviously we have to call our new function inside onUpdate. As first thing, in update quote position, let's get the word matrix let's set a translation matrix. For now we can pass a vector 3D at coordinates 0, 0, 0. The next thing to do is to set the view matrix. Let's set it as identity matrix. We will discuss about view matrix in the next tutorials. And as last thing, let's set the projection matrix. We will discuss better about it the next time. But we can say that we have to pass the size of our window. Very well, now we have to define our new matrices inside our shaders. So let's go to vertex shader HLSL file and in the constant C buffer let's start to add the word matrix, whose type is float 4 per 4. We don't have to forget to add the row measure keyword, since we are using this convention to build our matrices. Let's do this even for the view and projection matrices. Now we can copy past them inside the pixel shader file. Very good! It's arrived the moment to go in the vertex shader and convert our quote vertices from model space to screen space. To do this, let's multiply our vertex by the word matrix. Now we have the vertex in word space coordinates. At this point, we have to multiply this vertex with the view matrix. Moving it from word space to view space coordinates. As last thing, let's multiply it with the projection matrix in order to convert our vertex from view space to projection or screen space coordinates. Very well! Now our vertex can be processed by the rasterizer in order to be visible on screen. Let's build our program. Good! For now we have our code stuck at the origin. Let's start to move it. Let's change the Y coordinate from 0 to 1.
and this is the result. It has been moved of one unit along the Y coordinate. Now, let's start to move our polygon continuously using the same approach of the last tutorial by using the LERP function. Since now we have to apply LERP on CPU side, currently we don't have a LERP method to use, like in the vertex and pixel shader, so we have to implement it inside Vector3D. Let's do it. Let's define our new method as static, in order to be usable even if we don't create a Vector3D object. As parameters, we can add the start point, the end point, and the delta value. The LERP function must return a point that is the sum between two products. One that is the start point per one minus delta value. And the other one that is the end point per delta value. Very good! Before to use it, we have to implement the timing. As we have already said in the introduction, we have to implement the delta time, that is the elapsed time between the previous frame and the current frame. To do this, let's add three variables. All the delta, the time point when the previous frame was rendered, the new delta, that is the time point in which the, which the current frame is rendered, and delta time, that is the difference between the two. Now we can go to App Window, C++ file, and go to the end of onUpdate function. Here we can start to do all the computing about timing. The old delta will be the new delta 1, that correspond to the time point of the previous frame, new delta will be the current time point that we can get by using get tick count, and the delta time will be the difference between new delta and old delta. Now, let's add an inline condition. If the old delta have some value, we can do our difference and save it into delta time variable. Otherwise, we will set delta value to zero. In this way, we don't risk to have a delta time that equals to the new delta one, since all the delta at the very beginning, after the first frame, will be zero. Now that we have the delta time, we can start to use it to move our quote. As a first thing, let's turn back into update quote position and let's use the lerp method in the set translation method. What delta value we can use? Well, a value that increments of delta time per the number of units that we want to reach each second. To do this, let's add a new attribute in app window and let's call it m delta pose. Let's turn back and let's add to delta pose, for example, delta time per one. So we reach one unit at second. And then let's create a condition so that when uh, our variable reaches the unit, we can reset it to zero. 
Well, let's see how it behaves. Good, it works, but it's a bit fast, so let's slow down it a bit. Instead of multiply delta time by 1, let's, let's divide it by 4, meaning that we reach 1 unit in 4 seconds. Well, it's better now. Let's try 10 seconds now. Good, everything seems to work fine. Next thing to do is to implement the scale matrix. So let's go to matrix 4x4 class and let's create the set scale method. Here we have to do nothing but assign to the three cells of the diagonal the three coordinates inside vector 3D. And that's all. Let's try it out. Now we can improve a bit the animation, introducing the sign function like in the last tutorial, in order to scale in and scale out in an oscillatory way. Let's tune in a bit the delta value. Good! The last thing that remains to do is combining scale and translation matrices. So let's turn back to the matrix 4x4 class and let's implement the operator per equal method. Here we have to implement the algorithm for the multiplication between matrices. We have already seen how it works in the introduction, so the implementation shouldn't be difficult.
and we have finished the multiplication method. Now we can go back to up window. Let's start to add a new matrix that we can call temp. At this point, we have to set the translation matrix and multiply the scale matrix with the translation matrix. Very well, now our word matrix is ready. Let's check it out. Don't forget that the order in which matrices are multiplied is really important. Let's see, for example, if we choose as first matrix the translation instead of scale. As we can see, the effect is really different, as we already seen in the introduction. Very well! That's all for now, folks. Today, we have seen how to create and use transformation matrices. The next time, we will finally create our first 3D cube. I hope you enjoyed this video. See you soon. Thanks for watching.